Greetings. Greetings to all of you listening in, tuning in to this uh, live conversation. I am delighted to be here. Uh, joined with or by Sophie Strand. Welcome, Sophie. And um, yeah, just to give a little um, overview of the intention here for this conversation, and uh, I'll give a little further intro uh, to my guest here today. Um, this conversation is, in some ways, it's starting at the end. Uh, of, in this case, uh, Robert Bly's you know, fairly well-known book, Iron John, which came out initially in the early 90s. And um, the intent of this whole journey that will be sort of officially starting soon is to revisit Iron John um, in, you know, through a contemporary lens of, of, you know, what's going on now, particularly with the recent passing of Mr. Bly, of course, um, late last year. And for this particular journey and the journey to come, uh, I've decided to invite uh, some special guests with me who I know carry a particular um, amount of, of wisdom around particular themes held in throughout the chapters. And when I was considering this particular chapter for Iron John, which is actually the epilogue of the book, uh, The Wild Man in Ancient Religion, Literature and Folklife, I immediately thought of Sophie Strand. And uh, we've uh, actually a little bit about Sophie before I also share some of the uh, other collaborations that we've done to date. Sophie Strand is a writer based in the Hudson Valley who focuses on the intersection of spirituality, storytelling, and ecology. Her first book of essays, The Flowering Wand, Rewilding the Sacred Masculine, is coming, well, forthcoming in fall 2022 from Inner Traditions. Her ecofeminist historical fiction, I mean, I'm intrigued by that, uh, <laughs> Reimagining the Gospels of the Madonna Secret will also be available in spring 2023. Um, and uh, Sophie, we first interacted, uh, I mean, I was just catching some of her incredible essays that she was publishing you know, on her social media and, uh, you know, was deeply intrigued by her approach to the subject matter, which to me felt so different than much that I'd read, uh, particularly around masculinity and myth, uh, mycology. And so that we actually, uh, I invited her on my show, the other show, The Mythic Masculine Podcast. And since then, I mean, a gathering of stories and... Um, yeah, I'm just delighted to have another reason to talk with Sophie today. So once again, welcome, Sophie. Thank you so much for having me, Ian. You came on board to reading my stuff in the moment when it was coming into being. So I feel like mm. the podcast like refluxed into the work. Um, they're definitely braided. Yeah, mm. thank you for thank that. You. Beautiful. Um, so in the conversation today, as I said, we'll we'll dive into this epilogue chapter um, also as a way of uh, just approaching the, the whole journey to come, which officially begins next week. Uh, but, you know, before getting into the story, I actually wanted to just name or, or speak to um, the significance of reapproaching the story now. Uh, and maybe for you, Sophie, as well, to speak a little of, you know, what was your previous understanding or, or familiarity with the book Iron John prior to this moment? And, you know, what's, but despite the specific content, you know, that we'll get into in a bit, um, what was it about approaching the story uh, now, again, with the context of Bly's passing and also everything that's happened, of course, in the world? Hmm. Um, it's very interesting. When I first encountered his work, it was more just from a very young person's perspective who was interested in mythology um, and in archetypes. So I, I just kind of ate it whole um, without much um, analysis or criticism. And I think it was in the years that followed hearing a lot of older, not older women, but w women who were from older generations talking about how harmful it had been for them and um, talking about how it had inf infiltrated their lives in ways that they experienced as negative, that I began to perhaps re-look re at it with a different lens. However, I think where I'm at now with texts from so many different authors who I've both loved and been troubled by is, it's not about canceling or throwing it out, it's about composting it. You know, it's, you know, stories are supposed to always be adapting and up being updated. You know, storytelling has only recently become an ossified textual practice that doesn't constantly change. So coming back to Bly now, today, I'm more interested in looking at the texture, at what's good, what could be fermented into something more useful for right now. And for me, the important reframe is it is a very anthropocentric narrative. And it is an anthropocentric, almost biologically deterministic approach to gender. And instead of being critical of that, how can we update it and widen the lens to a more 
more than human kind of archetypal expression? How can we think about archetype not as being something solid or deterministic, but more as a kind of morphic um, field that's constantly evolving? Mm. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm coming to Bly is curiosity. How can we compost this? Can we, is it still useful? Mm. What could sprout? Mm. What about you? Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I wanted you to unpack a bunch of those words, which hopefully <laughs> we'll do in a moment. Um, but I'd say for me, and and you know, again, how much of this is just um, because I you know happen to uh, inhabit a male's body, or my particular conditioning has has made me fertile or, or receptive, right, to to yeah. what Bly spoke to or his own experience, you know, as a man in, in culture in this well, in the West, and. For me, finding it at 35, which is, you know, again, a time when he speaks to it as a sort of mythical time yeah. in the story, um, that it was, well, one, the, the way it came, which I've shared in other conversations, is through my grandfather who, who passed, you know, and uh, I found it in his study. And it was, again, there was a whole context there that was like wildly synchronistic. And there was something about finding it then and what was going on in my life. And uh, yeah, I felt like it was exactly the right moment. And I know that. I've talked with many men, right? Who say like, wow, that book came in yeah. you know, exactly the right time. And there's something in it too, that in a way illuminated my own experience that, that I was trying to make sense of, but also activated a deep sort of longing for like, why didn't I know this beforehand? Or like, why did, you know, why did I have to find this, um, in a, in a book, you know, 35, why wasn't I, this visited upon me by the elders, you know, in a, in an intact culture and community. And then, you know, he speaks to that in the book, this idea of, um, that this sort of thing, of course, would have been a sort of mystery, I don't know what to call it, like a, yeah, like a, like a mystery ritual um, space to, to guide. And, and again, so much of the modern West doesn't have this intactness anymore. And so we're sort of left to, you know, cobble it out and, you know, retreats and, uh, and books like this. And so on the one hand, absolutely being grateful for it. And on the other hand, yeah, pointing to the deep crater, right, of actual intact culture that it speaks to. And I think that was the case too when the book came out, um, uh, that, that it sort of ignited right this deep longing uh, in in particularly men in the West, and certainly was sort of feared and refuted by uh, a lot of others. I mean, I read some New York Times article came out around the same around that time, right, saying that yeah, that was basically you know veiled misogyny and and you know Bly himself, um, this bombastic character that uh, you know was sort of venerating the wild man. And which is what we're going to talk to today, but the wild man as a sort of, um, uh, you know, if people don't differentiate what they understand to be wild man, right? And he does in the book, he talks about the he does, savage yeah, and wild, yeah, exactly the wild and the savage man that people would just say, like, how could somebody be, you know, propping up and saying, yeah, we men need to be more wild when obviously so much of, uh, you know, violence and oppression and war and all this could be said as well, that's the wild man, you know, in full effect. So we actually need less of it. But of course, again, he goes into more nuance in the book. So I'll just say that, you know, as a cultural phenomenon, it's it's sort of undisputed that it really hit a nerve and yeah. continues to. And I think that uh, even for a new generation such as myself, it still holds a sort of mythic key. And, you know, again, we're, we're having a lot of more input and, and widening the scope um, and being able to not like critique or deconstruct. But I mean, I love that you say this idea of, of composting or, or fermenting. Right. And yeah. and then again, I think we'll get into that even more in a moment. So how about this before we do? Yeah, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll play the clip. I just have a clip actually from an animation uh, that's available on YouTube um, that uh, it, he calls it Iron Hans in the cartoon, which is yeah. uh, the, the initial original German. Name, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I just thought it was a nice way to sort of open up to the viewers uh, a little bit of this sort of mythic motif. It's a few minutes and uh, we'll see you on the other side. There was, once upon a time, a king who had a great forest near his palace, full of all kinds of wild animals. One day, a huntsman went into the forest with his dog.
When he emptied the lake, he could see there lay a wild man, whose body was brown like rusty iron, and whose hair hung over his face down to his knees on the bottom of the lake. The huntsman bound him with cords and led him away to the castle. The king had put him into an iron cage in his courtyard, forbidding, on pain of death, the cage door be opened. The queen herself was to safeguard the key. Give me my ball, the prince said. Not until you have opened the door for me, answered the wild man. The key is under your mother's pillow. You can get it there. Though the boy hesitated at first, finally he built up the courage to sneak into his mother's room and stole the key. The boy became afraid. He cried out, O oh, wild man, do not go away, or I shall get a beating. The wild man picked him up, set him on his shoulders, and ran into the woods. Mm. Those are amazing animations. Mm hmm yeah, I was delighted when I found it a few years ago. And I'm, I'm actually mm. really sad that the artist, I think it was actually a student project. Um, mm. The artist didn't do the whole thing. I mean, <laughs> it would be pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, but I hope that gives a little flavor. I mean, it sounds like you might have seen it before as well. But um, yeah, it gives a little flavor of that that motif, certainly part of the story. Um, and I'd love now to turn to the to the epilogue itself with Bly. And yeah. Um, yeah, again, I'm curious what uh, jumped out at you when you revisited it again this time. Hmm. I mean, I think for me, there is a little bit of a dissonance between the craft of the project and then the ultimate landing spot, which is the way he's actually structuring the project is very civilized and very intellectual. <laughs> and there are a lot of rules and stages. It's almost um, neo-Darwinian that they're, you know, you're evolving into the wild man, which is almost counterintuitive. So for me, the interesting thing is, is he, I don't feel like he quite lands it now that I'm reapproaching it, just in terms of craft, which is to to land at the in the wild man archetype, you have to do away with all the stages <laughs> and with all the rules and and the archety archetypal definitions and so so that was the that was one of the dissonances that i was picking up on now that i hadn't um experienced before um so when, when you say craft though again so now you're speaking right about the actual chapter itself yeah, the way yeah. that lie structures um well, the, you whole, give... the whole project of iron john itself yeah oh, okay interesting okay yeah and, and um by that meaning I mean, of course, it seems like this sort of primordial, and you know, yeah. I, I use the word primordial too. I think I can't help think of Martin Shaw, uh, who's, you know, said many times, he's like, I can't stand the word archetype. Um, but he he likes primordial in this case. But mm -hmm. there's some uh, sort of mythic DNA or core that yeah. initially was, um, it, I mean, Bly talks about, and of course, not just Bly, but this idea of this link between the human and animal realm. And yeah. that at least the if I could distill my understanding of so what is the wild man in relation to now and yeah. what he speaks to is it with the rise of domestication and, mm -hmm. and civilization and modernization that if we're just speaking about men in, in this experience that they yeah. feel they feel you know overly domesticated overly controlled their sort of wild instincts are suppressed and they come out in all these negative ways you know addiction numbing and the antidote to that within that construct is mm -hmm. to seek and to be able to embody or find places to embody, you know, the wild man, this sort of uncontained, you know, I say wild again, but connected to a more natural state yeah. is, the, is the construct. Um, and of course, there's all sorts of ways that can be, you know, misconstrued or, or overly fetishized, right? Which, as, yeah. which it has been in some cases. But anyway, so that to me is like the overall relationship between them. Yeah. And then, so I'm curious for you, yeah, what, what do you feel maybe wasn't his, or maybe missed the mark in, 
terms of either like the historical or cultural or well it's i mean maybe this isn't this isn't the most interesting avenue to go down just in terms of like the texture and all of the like the meat of the chapter just in terms of craft the project is very structured um the whole of iron john it's very much about like telling you what what you're supposed to think about what where where you're supposed to go what stages you're supposed to pass through mythologically you know initiatory rituals and stages and then you arrive at this place that's supposedly undomesticated. And I guess my question as a reader is, how do you become undomesticated through creating rules <laughs> and um, and stages? And you know, stage theory in general is very under uh, critique right now. And so I would say that th this book definitely falls into that category of of relying heavily on definitions and stages and a linear narrative. Um, some kind of ascent, even even though it is. I mean, that's the interesting thing about it. Even though it's it's articulated superficially as being kind of like going backwards, going to, towards the wild. It's still actually on a much deeper rhizomatic realm, wedded to a kind of social Darwinism almost. Um, so when you say social Darwinism, yeah, meaning the, uh, I, I mean, maybe I don't fully really grasp that concept for you. Yeah. If figuring out how to best improve yourself. How, how to how to how to make yourself better that if you do these things you'll be a complete adult and i think that's a theme that runs through the whole book which is you know you are you are not because you're not initiated you're not a true adult and it's not about the king initiating you it's about the wild man initiating you but i would say that the king and the wild man are ultimately interchangeable within the story um interesting i might push back on you on that no though. yeah i understand yeah. no i mean they have they have very different resonances but I think that in terms of what they're doing culturally, it's the same thing. Culturally. Well, so so this is interesting then. Yeah. So because for, so for me, in my understanding of at least how he articulates again, the wild man is yeah. in some ways as a primordial pre-civilized, yeah. you know, relationship. And of course, then we see the he, he messages it or he speaks to it in this chapter, this yeah. connection to Dionysus, right? To Pan yeah. as in yeah. as in a sort of how it flowers and fruits yeah. right in different cultural moments like this primordial yeah. masculine energy for example or, or, yeah. or let's say archetype whereas the king is understood at least in the cosmology of yeah. you know most modern men's work yeah. is this sense that the king is this sort of civilized pinnacle or mature pinnacle mm -hmm. um in some ways to the counterpoint to the primordial wild man so yeah so no, they understand. actually have a diff much different role yeah i, under I understand that and I, I guess what i'm saying is as um He's created two, two hierarchies that um, perhaps look opposed, but ultimately mirror each other, um, where there's a man on top who gets to initiate another man. Um, so even though they're perhaps, you know, their substance is, is different, elementally different, they're enacting the same kind of hierarchical structure, um, which is interesting. I mean, the thing for me that I was really struck by was I was I was thinking about he so he summons Pan, he summons Dionysus, and it's interesting that he also summons Esau. That was I was I was struck by that. Um, who is? Can you? I, I remember reading that as well. But do you? Could you speak more about who that person or subject is? Esau is a um, Old Testament character who. Um, he is associated with um, peripatetic nomadic culture. He takes care of the goats. And his brother, um, what is it, Saul? Um, what is his name? I'm forgetting the exact names. This is embarrassing as someone who's supposed to be really proficient in the Old Testament. His brother pretends to be him and betrays him. And it's this original rift story, like the bifurcation of nature and man. Um, and... I thought that was an interesting thing to to draw on because I'm a, a, almost more interested in the stereomorphic, so like half man, half um, animal, like less wild man, more animal man, <laughs> less lord of the beasts, more beastly lord um, mm. characters that are... The thing about Bly that I think is interesting is it's like he doesn't quite, he goes back to Roman mythology and pretends to dip his toe into Greek mythology, but he doesn't seem to actually have much um, rooting in pre-Roman pre mythology. So he's often like using Romanized versions of myths that actually have pre-Greek origins. I was surprised that he seems to reference the scholar Carl Karenyi a lot without um, having gone deep with, with that pre-Roman Dion Dion Dionysian information, which is um, 
it's very much less about wild band characters and much more about, you know, Acteon being actually turned into a stag. And that's, here's something interesting I was thinking about is that's the story that kept coming back for me mm. when I was reading this chapter is the story of Acteon, which is if you, so if you look at the Roman version, it's this, of course, it's Acteon confronting the dark mother, you know, and the dark mother kills him and feeds him to his dogs. And so that can be, that, that feels like a very Bly level interpretation of the myth. But if you go deeper and you actually look at earlier iterations of this mythology, what you actually have is a marriage between the horned god and the goddess of the grove, who actually honors the man by turning him into an animal. So it, it, he, by turning him into a deer, she's making him lord of the woods. Sir Nunos, who Bly also mentions in this chapter. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting to start thinking about boundaries, blurring the boundaries. So, so Bly is very interested in categories that are clean. And I think that one of the ways we can rehabilitate Bly is by going in and blurring the boundaries a little bit, especially between the wild man. Like, can we turn the wild man into an animal rather than a lord of animals? That's kind of what I'm interested in. And I think he provides an opening for that. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, you know, I'm reminded too, I mean, earlier on in the chapter as well, I mean, he goes back to, you know, it's called the hunting era is the yeah. section, mm -hmm. right? But he, he does talk about this, this recognition that the, this idea, this blurring of boundaries, right? This, yeah. this blurring of, you know, the wild man or the um, lord of the animals, or lord of animals. I don't hear it. Yeah, what he says here, part human, part God, part animal. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, yeah. there's some And he clear... does, he summons, he summons the shaman or like the animal figure of Troffer, which I think is a really interesting visual um, depiction of, of the wild man. Mm. He says here, um, he says this story and hundreds like it suggests a compact was made sometime in the past between the human realm and the animal realm, and that the agreement seems to be a tough one, providing obligations and rights on each side. Um, now, that to me also was interesting because I think this is the part that often gets missed, I think, in contemporary mm -hmm. interpretations yeah. of the wild man when it's only about uh, like personal growth, right? Or certain, yeah. kind of, this is what I mean by fetishizing the wild man that I see I often happen within you know, the men's movement uh, now is that it becomes about like, look at how sort of wild I can express myself. Um, but what I hear here is that actually to to really be faithful to the wild man or to that primordial obligation is to actually awaken to one's consequence or one's um, need for reciprocity, right? Yeah. To the to the other world. And like, that's the consequence of actually um, bridging or blurring those worlds. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so for me, like that's uh, revisiting again and hearing even then he was kind of like saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like, it's not a personal growth project. Like it's actually about awakening strongly to now, like what's needed now in the world. Yeah. I mean, I think a figure who we were talking about before this started, who would have really um, given a musculature to this whole final chapter um, is the figure of Merlin and Lilokin and the Mad Men of early Welsh annals and England, which is, it's this figure that's often can you know wearing antlers or fur or has hair all over his body so very much like the wild man that Bly is summoning and you know he's he's the proto arthurian myths he's you know he becomes joffrey of monmouth in 1136 writes this history that's basically just fantasy where he kind of creates the arthurian myths and enshrines merlin by combining all of these feral creatures and beings but what i think is really interesting about them that for me summons what Bly is um, pointing towards is that it's a figure who comes in to advise kings and prophecy, mm. but then goes mad when he sees the violence of man and must go back to the forest and receive the counsel of animals. So he's weaving a relationship. And this kind of seems to me to point towards those rites and those rituals that you need to keep happening. He always has to go back to the forest to receive the counsel of the more than human world in order to be properly in the world of men. And that seems, I mean, I, you could argue that that's what the prince is doing. He's, and he does, he goes back and forth to the forest and to the world of men. He's weaving, he's a weaver. 
to 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 gift that you know a, a a craft that is often feminized to men we can think of the wild man actually as being a weaver of of two different worlds mm. hmm. yeah thanks for that i love that i mean there's something about i see in something i've tracked to and you know other conversations within gathering of stories and my podcast yeah. this sense of loss of contact with the world yeah. right with with the beyond human and the consequence of that right and one could say that civilization i believe civilization yeah. itself or industrial civilization especially has deeply lost contact with this council of you know i don't even want to say council of nature because again that doesn't make any sense when one is willing Our to family. break down yeah exactly and so to have these uh these trans honestly transgressors in some ways these weavers yeah. uh as counsel of course for the king and maybe that's also where i see this link that um at least mythically within this construct at yeah. least in the mythopoetic movement the king's role is to be order yeah uh, right to to generate order uh not oppressively right because that would be the tyrant king yeah. is to so much order that it strangles like the life flow of of the world and or the land, but to be willing to bring order as a necessary component, um, but not to lose contact with the more than human as as tr where true counsel comes from. Yeah, I mean, I don't have you read The Once and Future King by T.H. White? No. Okay. Sounds really though. I yeah. would say that everyone who's interested in a study of masculinity should read this book. It's mm. brilliant. It's a classic. It's also a children's book. So it's a great thing to read if you have a son to read to a son. I, yeah. yeah. Um, I was read it, me and my brother were read it by my dad when we were growing up. And it's a retelling of, if you've seen the Disney movie Sword in the Stone, that's what it's based on, which is it's a, it's a very playful retelling of the Arthurian myths where the figure of Merlin comes in and tutors Arthur. And the way that he tutors Arthur, the king, you know, who has to make decisions, who has to create a family, go to work, you know, support people, who has to rely on certain types of, of order to make life happen mm -hmm. and sustainable and to create kinship and reciprocal relationships in order to create that being who is who creates who who facilitates a family and a kingdom looks over a whole kingdom he turns arthur into other animals he yeah. turns arthur into hawks and hedgehogs and tadpoles and so his education is not in the stories of men but in the consciousnesses of other beings um, which I think is a really helpful idea of like, what does it mean to be the wild man? It, it, it's not quite about stages, but maybe it's about different types of being. Um, to be a man is to be many, is to, to, to be able to, th to embody the, have an empathic flexibility. Um, mm. So, but yeah, you know, you have to, we can't do away with the king archetype. We can't do away with any of these archetypes. And I, th I think that's why I'm always trying to say, like, you just have to add more. You have to add them into an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I do think the one interesting thing about Iron John that um, Bly really shows is it is an ecosystem of characters. <laughs> it is. It's relational. The whole story is relational. Everything happens through this tugging, this weaving, this teaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I uh, I see story as well, and this is the case certainly in other contexts that I've, um, I've we've we've approached myth in different different conversations, yeah. but how they're prismatic, right? Like they, yeah, it's it's very hard to pin down and say, okay, well, this always means this, right? Yeah. Like like or any any myths return to in a current context or how you're looking from a current lens, yeah. all of a sudden, right? They shape shift as they should yeah. as something that's alive, and so I think to revisit Iron John now, I mean, as it was initially put put down with lie of course is even different than when the, it would have been told you know in uh bavaria or, or wherever it was yeah you know? um and and what a beautiful thing and so to revisit it again within this context it's going to reveal different things um i wanted to touch in though on uh, one aspect yeah. as well that he speaks to in this um chapter which is um something that you, you've spoken to too about this idea of composting uh sacrifice or at least uh, you know the the sort of returning again um the fungal gods right this 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 link here and you know we've touched on dionysus and you've spoken yeah. to Ice, or horus or, or a number of pantheons. osiris yeah osiris. Addis, adonis there are a lot of them yeah yeah and so here here bly says and i'll just read the line yeah uh it says in our industrial system we ignore the great mother and we ignore the lord of animals also mm -hmm. we are some of the first people in history who have tried to live without honoring him and his depth his woundedness and his knowledge of appropriate sacrifice as a result, our sacrifices have become unconscious, regressive, pointless, indiscriminate, self-destructive, 
and massive. And that, that hits me in, in ways I'm still trying to reflect on, but something around by not, and, I, and again, I'm not talking about where, you know, we got to find sacrificed little victims, but it's, it's more like the nature of understanding a kind of reciprocity or a kind yeah. of returning again. And, and to not have that encoded within a, an actual present and alive mythology or, or a being, it becomes unconscious. That's what I hear. Not only unconscious, but deeply destructive. But I, again, I wonder what stirs for you with hearing that. I mean, the thing that stirred for me when I read that was actually this image of the Hieros Gamos, which, um, you know, the, the fusion of the Hieros Gamos is the ancient marriage and it, it's not even a marriage. It's the sexual union of the, you know, the Lord and the lady um, or the two opposed counterparts, the yin and the yang, mm -hmm. um, the light and the dark. We don't have to gender these things. And for me, of course, whenever I talk about Hieros Gamos these days, I always summon lichen because I'm always trying to turn towards the more than human, turn towards plants and animals and fungi. Um, and then we can also turn away from um, gender binaries that are culturally imposed and not actually physically realized. Um, and for me, the thing that seems to be repressed there that he's that he's pointing to is that because we don't have we don't let ourselves fuse and have true union with our equals and with our family, with our with our wild feral kin, we create this 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 repressed the end that that eruptive um sacrifice and violence um and it's because of this repression that we create this deranged sacrifice of the world at our own expense um so for me i think one of the the struggles i have with this text right now and i'm just i'm just reapproaching it in the past couple of days this is like you know in process which it's messy i like it um i probably won't ever stop thinking about this <laughs> um, but is I do think that he's very concerned with differentiation, like differentiation from the mother, understanding the differentiation from the father. And I do, I do think that maybe right now is not about differentiation. And it could have been very a very helpful frame when this book first came out for men. But I think right now, you know, if we think of evolution, often, you know, evolution is it forks, it forks, it forks, things branch off, but then it fuses you know, our very cells are the product of mitochondria and um, early prokaryotes fusing that, you know, viruses and bacteria exchange DNA. Um, and I think this is a moment to, to perhaps trouble the, the focus of differentiation that Bly mm. um, has injected into this text and start to focus more on, less on the, the mother and the father and more on the hieros gamos, the fusion of the two. Mm. Yeah, you know, there's this leaps out in a number of different directions for me. Uh, you know, one, I want to bookmark the Hieros Gamos, as you said, mm -hmm. um, and I want to speak to some one of the threads that I feel like I've sort of found or unearthed or at least understood differently now is the, again this idea of differentiation, which yeah. I think started with Jung. Yeah, um, right. This idea of like, oh yeah, that's like um, sort of a necessary um, journey to, to maturation, yeah. right? To differentiate, and at least as Bly speaks about it in the book. Um, this idea again, you know, as you saw in the first little um, animation clip there, there was the bit about uh, the wild man being in the cage and of course yeah. the boy playing with his ball. Bly talks about the ball being sort of primordial joy or sort of right. initial joy of just being and aliveness that the boy has, right? And then throughout, you know, the course of his life, he loses that joy um, through different, you know, griefs and and sadnesses. And, and, and that ball is then sort of in the cage with the wild man, right? And he yeah. has a gorgeous line, Bly, though. He says something like, you know, mo some men return to, the or return to the cage at 35 and ask for the ball back, right? And Iron Man says, well, you gotta let me out. And, you know, he says, well, where, you know, how do I let you out? I don't have the key. He says, it's under, my, it's under your mother's pillow. And he says, some men turn around and never go back, right? But some, they proceed into the, the theft right of the key and that's yeah. that scene is there's tons and tons about that right that and I, you know we'll be going into it in the course to come as yeah. well but for me there's something really really powerful though about something around the psyche of um at least those conditioned male and the feminine and the mother is the primordial feminine right the primordial mm -hmm. link with source as the as the goddess incarnate right absolutely and there's some sort of necessary uh transgression or, or break i should say which is what i understand the old initiated and the old initiating 
uh, elders would do is deliberately separate the link as an adolescent to the mother because both uh, sort of spatially but also psychologically there is a consequence with that like there is a consequence by not having that link broken and I see it I mean I've seen it in myself and I've seen it in a lot of men that transpose right those dynamics onto their existing partners we're talking about a, a heterosexual dynamics so there's things at play here but I want to just lay that out for a second and say there's a parallel consequence though to or, or, or like why this happens um, primarily within nuclear family dynamics mm -hmm. and like that to me is the actual difference that I don't think Bly talks about or, or I haven't seen as much in sort of psychological um, commentary about it but this idea that when one is surrounded in a village context with a lot of different you know uncles and aunties and father figures yeah. and mother figures there's less of a psychological need to break or to differentiate and so for me seeing it now as oh this is one of the consequences of the collapse of that's right, fascinating a, a, yeah, yeah a wider a wider uh vessel for the psychological maturation of a child yeah um i mean i have so many thoughts i you know i'm thinking a lot about um sex at dawn's kind of articulation of like village culture and how mm. you know it's much less about yeah differentiating from a mom and dad when you have like eight moms and dads who are all looking after you yeah. and you know as someone who's thinking a lot about what it would mean to have a kid and and you know and that's just something that you're thinking about day to day. Um, I think I'd want to have a kid within a community where, you know, the failures of one set of parents <laughs> had less of an impact on a kid because a lot of different people and elders were initiating kids into lots of different experiences. Mm -hmm. And and I, I think that that's, that's the antidote to, to this kind of simplistic heteronormative nuclear family idea of having to break. I mean, I think one of the issues that a lot of people have with Iron John is the way it puts a lot of pressure on the mother and um, is always deflecting from the father figure. And it's not about saying that the father is the demon and the mother is the angel. I think that's also just as problematic, but it's more important to just say that, you know, mothers have, have experienced a lot of violence. <laughs> um, and in fact, in America in particular, mothers are dying at unprecedented rates when they give birth to children. <laughs> Um, I mean, we're like the worst <laughs> at um, maternal death rates. I was just talking to a journalist who's been covering this and it's really, and the, she was saying actually, interestingly enough, that it's the numbers we're ignoring are the women who's come close, but don't quite die, <laughs> mm. but have permanent disability. Um, so I do think that there's, there's a problematic, I, I think Bly had a very particular relationship with his mom. And if he had been a little bit more direct about that and how individually he, he experienced the mother and didn't generalize, it might have given this text a little bit more grit. Because I think that the generalized I, I approach to the mother has been one of its main criticisms. And mm. there are good parts of this book. And that I think that generalization has unfortunately eclipsed some of the better parts of the book. But yeah, I agree with you that I think creating... Thinking more about community rather than the sterile fictional idea of a nuclear family. Because a nuclear, yeah, you, of course, when you have just like two parents that necessarily have dysfunction and flaws, because of course they do, you have what, to differentiate. Never. What do you that. mean? Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah, of course, differentiation is absolutely important. But if you come of age in, in a village and in a community, it's much, it's less about differentiation, it's more about weaving yourself into the community. Yeah. You know, I want to just go back to one of the pieces you mentioned, yeah. you know, the the flack that the mother gets um, yeah. in the book. And, I, and again, I remember, I think it was the New York Times article, too, it's saying, oh, yeah. you know, he's blaming the mother for everything. Yeah. Uh, and and it's interesting, though, because, you know, reading it myself as well, more, again, multiple times now, yeah. revisiting at different times, he spends a lot of, of space talking about this need to, he calls it um, making space, making two rooms in the house of the father. Uh, or at least one's own psychological house of the father, right? One for the light father and one for the darkened father. But this mm -hmm. idea that if one has only positive projection on their father, then, you know, all of the ways in which they don't measure up or they have, you know, shadow, whatever it is, then mm -hmm. there's this like disconnect, right? This um, dissonance. And then the same thing though with the, if, if one only sees their father's negative and didn't, you know, show up for me and, you know, the, the quote father work that is a massive piece of men's work uh, now, even contemporarily, uh, speaks to that, like that there is a real need to contend with 
but in some ways, again, seeing it as the fallout of not having other adults around that could also check parents for their, you yeah. know, for their, 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 um, unconscious shadow um, and, and how often that visits upon the kids. So I'll, I'll just say that, that the Bly yeah. spends a lot of time basically speaking to the faults of the father, or at least how to negotiate that. And yeah. he's very explicit where he says, it's not so much like the mother, but it's the failure of the old men, essentially the old initiators to come and do their job. Maybe that's, the empire, <laughs> maybe that's Bly saying, hey, wait a second. Well, this is what I mean. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's important to also situate Bly within the time period, which is this moment where it does seem important to start looking at the mother and father and the baggage they're both carrying. And he does do that. I do think that, you know, a feminist critique is that women are objects. The woman is supposed to be, is, is you know, the, the princess, and you know, is supposed to be one. You know, the mother is supposed to be differentiated from. And that perhaps a more interesting story would do what I would love him to do, which is to bring the female and the male into a more complicated reciprocal relationship. Um, but in, here's the thing about Bly. We are all the products of our time periods. Like he, he has been inherited. Hmm, let me think about how to put this. That book saved men's lives. Like I, there are so many men who've come to me who I love and that book saved them. And that means a lot to me. And those men are inheriting that book. And that book has meant a lot to you. And I think that storytelling is supposed to be inherited and supposed to be changed. And I think that, yeah, I guess my question to storytellers inside the masculine is how can we continue to update the story in ways that are nourishing? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, th I mean, this is what I think we're, <laughs> exactly. we're in the process of endeavoring to do right now and to... Yeah, to 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 revisit to to dynamically again, not not deconstruct yeah. and point out flaws, but actually to say, okay, so yeah, what does it mean now? You know, how yeah. does it how does it speak to now? Um, and I think that the, you know, even like the references within the book itself, of course, are necessarily again a product of the time. Um, yeah. It's interesting though tracking uh, Bly's journey also as a man yeah. that you know he he got to men's work and and myth you know way later. Like I've heard yeah. you know sort yeah. of cresting into his sixties, and he'd obviously been already a pretty radical poet, you know, for many years, activist. Um, and um, in his own trajectory as well, you know, he he followed up this book um, with, I believe I have it like literally over my desk there, uh, The Maiden King, right? Yeah, Which I haven't read his, that one, yeah. Yeah, it's his combination or his uh, collaboration with Marion Woodman, of course, yeah. one of the premier yeah. sort of mythic Jungian figures of the on the women's side. Mm -hmm. And so again, this unification or this, this yeah. wedding between them was clearly, you know, was sort of in the architecture from the outset. Uh, and I'll say in some ways, perhaps we're at a time now where there is a, a sort of evolutionary moment culturally. I mean, again, just speaking of, let's say, the West, that maybe there there is a readiness, you know, where I, where this sort of mythic wedding, I don't know if it actually was really, it wasn't ripe then, actually, it was maybe before yeah. its time. Um, and so that's to my curiosity, again, of, you know, it's not revisiting the same cultural context that was, you know, early yeah. 90s, um, but it's also not throwing it out and saying, okay, you know, dated, you know, what's next? No, because I mean, everything's dated. I'm, I mean, God, like every male author I read was a sexist pig and also <laughs> deeply informed me. And I loved reading their work. And onwards we go, you know, that's just kind of because we're all the products of, you know, the, the things that are baked, the prejudices that are baked into us culturally. Um, and I think maybe the prejudice that we should think about right now is less about I'm gonna take you with me. <laughs> no and I think this is a spam call. Um, You're very persistent. Less about um, the difference between men and women, and more about our relationship to our ecology and our environmental context. And so, I guess, I guess, my question is how how could this be updated in a way that brought us into more dynamic relationship with environmental causes? Um, and that's mm -hmm. an open question. Um, I mean, I thought it was interesting that he brought up the Mary Magdalene figure in, because that's also one of my other areas of, of scholarship, that she was also covered in hair. And I was thinking about, like, I wish, like, we could end with, like, them, like, the wild man and the Mary Magdalene figure covered in fur, like, going back into the forest and becoming animals again. 
And of course, that's a little simplistic and fetishistic. But how do we how do we complete the circle? How do we back to the forest? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like uh, creative nonfiction in the making. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, but it strikes me as again as well, like, you know, this particular journey um, that we're embarking on yeah. uh, is it's the first time it's been open. I mean, I've, I've been I've taught it with others twice to men and this yeah. time it's open now to all genders. Yeah. And I'm really curious, again, what would happen in that space? Like what would happen with having that different uh, those different perspectives, different experiences on it? Um, because again, there's a certain magic that happens. It seems to be when men gather and gather around this story. And, yeah. and now I'm really curious what happens now when we, when all genders gather. Um, and I also curious again, like, you know, cause you've used this idea of um, speaking to the, you know, like an ecology of genders or, or sort of stepping yeah. outside, a, of course, the heteronormative binary and things like that. But I'm also, I'm trying a hard time fathoming, like if, like, what is, what is a post-gender capital uh, approach to the moment um, as well because I don't hear your I don't think you're saying that completely post because I do know there is a uh, sort of within feminism and, and this idea that gender is only oppressive and all gender needs to be sort of dissolved um, I'm not saying you're saying that either but I'm trying to situate myself within on different different ideas or different yeah. ecosystems of, of how does one proceed um, you know how does one have labels or at least differentiate enough to be able to even have conversations about things right because that's that's the kind of overall critique often of the a sort of radical deconstructivist approach is like well how do we say you know what do you, what is a man then at all or what is a woman or you know non-binary all these things start to just become free-floating for me i agree i think that there's this impulse towards a homogenizing universalism where like nothing has anything that's different. And, you know, we're all the same. There's no such thing as gender. There's no such thing as, um, but they're different, you know, change happens because there's gradients that there are slight differences in incline and in, um, expression and morphology create the very systems of weather and streams and mountains and air current. And I think that, being playful. I mean, for me, even the writing of my book is like, I feel in something. It feels like something. It feels like a wave field, a morphic field, like a hat. It feels like, so morphic fields were this idea that was brought up in the relationship to how animals develop and especially in relationship to embryology. But then it was developed, which is like, how do, so our DNA codes proteins, but those proteins actually don't code for form. Like the cells of your arm and the cells of your leg are inherently the same. So there are a lot of questions still to this day about how form um, And so morphic fields are patterns of behavior that structure the morphology of beings, the, like the, the morphic um, expression. Um, so for terms under the ground, fungi under the ground are just hyphal tissue, like little filamentous threads. And then at a certain point, decide to be a mushroom. Like, you know, the Eiffel Tower split out of your hand, but they don't have any information inside of them that tells them when and how to create form. And so for me, the masculine is almost like a, a morphic field. <laughs> like it's less a biology or a specific you're given, but it's a field you tap into. And I think that there are a lot of people who are inside of that field and would do well to start understanding what the possibilities of that field could look like. Mm. Um, so I think it's really important that we explore masculinity. Um, Cause I do feel thing. I mean, I think it's evolving. And one of the other things that Rupert Sheldrake says in relationship to morphic resonance is it evolves. These patterns are there, but they're also slowly. Mm. Yeah. I think we just lost you right at the end there, but you said the patterns evolve and then we something. The patterns are constantly changing. So there's there's a habit, but the habit is widening. So I think actually right now we can say the, that masculinity is a wave field <laughs> so that, that a lot of beings are inside of. Some of them are half inside, some of them have a toe in, some of them are fully inside, and it's widening right now. So, mm. so what would a thicker, you know, um, biocomalate says like, we need a thicker we, we need a thicker masculinity. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. I mean, that to me is such a, it's such a, what's the word? It's like a, a acrobatic thought 
that uh, that I love. Like, as in, I I really I love being able to try to wrap my head around. Like, okay, what does that mean? I mean, another parallel example might be a conversation I had with a uh, uh, a trans um, uh, sort, sort of spiritual guide, but her name is uh, Genevieve Sophia Dow, right? And there's I love that conversation. Yeah. Yeah, and she she speaks of this idea that masculinity is a theatrical spirit. And, that feels correct. Yeah. 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 And so, and so for me, it's like, well, so it so it breaks it out of this idea that, of course, masculinity corresponds to gender or, or at least, um, let's say, particular sex organs. And that, that's been obviously under contention for some time. Um, but to me, then I'm still grappling with this idea well, how do we, yeah, how do we, how do we differentiate, but also experiment and allow and, and not create a kind of a restrictive um, categories of, you know, definition. And, and I think you're speaking to that now. I think it's about planting the dualism in a polyphony of voices. So it's not about saying that there's no masculine and feminine, but saying that there are a lot of other different gradients of that around it. Mm. So I think it's just about being conscious and asking questions. So, you know, I, I, for me, my favorite, and we've talked about this before, we talked about this in the, this in the podcast, is the, the real breakthrough moment in Wolfram von Aschenbach's um, Parsifal is when Parsifal turns to the wounded king, speaking of wounding and wounded kings, um, and says, what ails thee? So and, and instead of saying, what ails thee, we, you know, it's, it might be helpful to say, like, what does this feel like for you? How do you express yourself? What do you identify with? And it takes a little bit more time now that we're not just on site identifying people by a cultural idea of what gender is supposed to look like. So it takes a little bit more time. But I actually think we can take this practice and even take it out of gender. Because at, at the end of the day, thinking about gender is a little bit like rearranging the deck chairs in the Titanic as ecological crisis and, and the extinctions multiply, mm -hmm. um, which is maybe we can take that same curiosity that we're practicing, that muscle that we're developing as we're asking people what gender means to them, you know, what masculinity, what femininity might mean for them. And we can apply that to our ecosystems. How can we be more interrogative with beings and say like, okay, I think you're a bird, but what are you doing? What story are you living? What do you care about? Um, yeah. Mm. Mm, thanks for that. You know, what comes to me is, uh, you know, in some cursory study of languages that actually have much more of a descriptive yeah. relationship, right, to beings or beingness. Um, mm -hmm. I think of indigenous languages, which you'll have like, you know, rather than saying that's uh, that, you know, <laughs> a kind of, a kind of yeah. noun that, that sort of cuts it off as some sort of objective reality. It's to say, oh, well, that's the being that gathers at this time of year and, and you know, forages in this particular way. Like that's the kind of yeah. how they would label things, which makes mm -hmm. obviously a much more relational uh, sense. Um, and I hear that same kind of in, invitation that you're making there. Um, so maybe maybe we can do this, which is like, I am the woman who is often masculine around the full moon and then also trans sometimes. And, you know, like maybe we can have mm. these these lengthier identifications that are more complex and, and denote more intimacy and awareness of each other. Um, yeah, thanks for that. That's beautiful. I mean, I like this idea of, again, like also dynamically changing yeah. Uh, uh, versus this idea of like trying to figure out, okay, well, what are you, mm -hmm. right? I, like this need to nail it down, uh, which happens when there's a discomfort, of course, within gender roles or, or gender performance uh, when, when certain I, things are challenged. Yeah. I, it's an impulse I get. And I think that right now everything feels very uncertain. So there's an impulse for stable value systems. So yeah. I, you know, we, we want, and, and that's not a bad thing. It's, it's an understandable survival mechanism. We're trying to make sense of a world that feels very scary. Yeah. Um, so I think it's about oscillating in and out of recognizing how scared we are. And then also, and then maybe taking a step out and, and trying something different. And then, then maybe going back to what feels safe for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think Iron John can be a, a anchor. You know, you're you're allowed to go out, but then you're like you you can use it as as a, a firm mythological anchoring while you do some exploring. Mm. Mm. I love that mythological anchor. Uh, to close our conversation today, of which has been highly enjoyable to me and hopefully to yeah. all of you tuning in, uh, is you you have this sense, or you just sort of touched on this idea that now with uh, Mr. Bly's passing, that there's some also a kind of uh, I mean a kind of composting of his spirit or or a sort of a, a releasing into 
you know, uh, almost like uh, Dionysus himself. Uh, I mean, yeah. or one one that called forth and inhabited Dionysianness, you know, among us. Uh, and I wonder again, how do you see that as this diffusion of Mr. Bly in this time? Well, it's great, which is, I was thinking about Osiris, which is Osiris is split into 14 pieces um, traditionally in Egyptian mythology that Isis then plants all over Egypt, with that, which then creates the, the ecosystem of Egypt, um, and especially the inundated fertile soil along the Nile. And I think, and I'll, you know, in Dionysus Zagreus, um, we also see that mulching, you know, putting of the god's body back into the earth. And I think Bly was a person who offered himself pretty freely. Like he was a person who I think was highly involved with other people and with sharing and inspiring other people. So it, we can think of him as having offered quite a bit, <laughs> you know, to the landscape, to the ecosystem, to, to, to many voices. And so how can we let those, those, those different dispersed parts of him sprout? you know? Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. And I mean, I, I hope, you know, those of us also who are continuing to wonder and, and bring forth the myths and new contexts and, and in his spirit and in new ways is that is part of that. Yeah. Uh, um, I think you're doing it. I mean, this isn't a very, a very blind spirit, I would say. Mm. I'll yeah. take that as a deep, deep compliment. Um, thank you, Sophie. Uh, well, I think we'll call it there uh, to, to right. end our conversation today. Yeah. Once again, Thanks so much for your time, Sophie. Such a Thank pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I want to highlight once again the forthcoming books that you have, which um, <laughs> you know you go into in much more detail. Uh, mm -hmm. But the Flowering Wand, Rewilding mm -hmm. the Sacred Masculine, forthcoming this fall, as mm -hmm. well as the uh, Ecofeminist Historical Fiction, <laughs> uh, The Madonna Secret. Yeah, in spring mm -hmm. 2023. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm sure be announcements about that. You're also pretty active on Instagram for sure, and uh, Facebook, and I'm 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 offering writing all the time. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Beautifully so. I'm writing on Achilles right now, actually. So who I think is a misunderstood um, masculine hero who we can reclaim. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Beautiful. <laughs> well, those of you who want to join the uh, entire journey, which is starting next week in partnership with Roe, will be myself and a number of other special guests uh, open to all genders. Uh, check out revisitingironjohn.com uh, and sign up. I mean, it's going to be pretty wild and phenomenal. I can tell already. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate Sophie for helping us kick it off in such a good way. Thanks for having me in. Okay. To be continued.